Here's where it all began when in 1778, under orders from George Rogers Clark, the early settlers left Corn Island in the Mid-Ohio River for the mainland, locating at what is now 12th Street and Rowan, Louisville's first settlement, named Fort on Shore. Life was difficult in the early town of Louisville and growth was sluggish at first, achieving a population of only 359 souls by 1800. But we managed to grow to 1,357 by the year 1810. The map shown here was part of Louisville's first history book written in 1819 by Dr. Henry McMurtry. Although somewhat speculative, the map shows remarkably well what would become the actual layout of the city, including that of Portland, Shipping Port, Jeffersonville, and Clarksville. By the end of the first decade of the 1800s, steamboat travel on the inland waterways became a reality. The early steamboats, such as the Condor, were slow but could make it to the new city of Louisville from as far as New Orleans. As time went on, the steamboats became much more conducive to entertainment and creature comforts. Among them, music and entertainment, especially on long trips from places like New Orleans. From the earliest years, the music being played for the public was influential and it carried over to the cities all along the Ohio River. Going north and Louisville going east to Frankfurt and Lexington. Louisville was poised for growth. By 1840 our population had expanded to well over 21,000 making it the 16th largest city in the nation. Seems like we've heard that lately too. A claim which would later repeat itself. At the peak of steamboat travel around 1860, over 2,000 steamboats arrived and departed from the city of Louisville. In that past slide, popular yodeler and banjo player Cy Reinhardt and his ragtime band played on the Idlewild, now the Belle of Louisville. Between that was the Avalon. Yeah. The Southern Exposition. The Southern Exposition in Louisville was the single most defining event ever to take place in this city. It occupied over 44 acres of land with booths and displays of agriculture, arts, industry, building trades, and very importantly, music. Historian Brian Bush in his book about the exposition mentions that the Fisher and Baldwin grand pianos were promoted. The very popular Kappa and his 7th Regiment band gave morning and evening concerts and the Patrick Gilmore band provided musical entertainment. There was a beautiful pipe organ in the auditorium of the exposition also. So in many ways the Southern Exposition helped jumpstart the city with its use of electricity furnished by Thomas Edison and providing entertainment which would influence the future. The exposition ran 1883, was supposed to end in 1884, but it was so popular that it remained in place until 1887 before it was dismantled. Another source of music performance were the gardens, just called beer gardens. The early open-air gardens were of course the result of not having electricity or ventilation to operate an indoor venue. Gardens were popular throughout the late 1800s and into the 1900s. Even today many restaurants and entertainment venues have an adjunct garden. Louisville had many such gardens. Shown here was Phoenix Hill Park probably Louisville's most popular beer garden, which opened in 1865. It was part of the Phoenix Hill Brewery located on the southwest side of Baxter Avenue near Payne, Barrett, and Rubel. It had a dance hall complete with a bandstand. All of this, of course, was to showcase 
the Phoenix Bohemian Beer. It brought in such entertainment as Philip, John Philip Sousa's band. Woodland Gardens, one of the first of the gardens in the city of Louisville Woodland, opened in the 1820s in the east end of Market Street between Wenzel and Johnson Streets, where the stockyards would locate later. It was referred to as the nearest retreat from the city and mostly served the workers who were employed in the Butchertown distilleries, butcheries, tanneries, and candle and soap makers. They provided a variety of entertainment, including target shooting, fighting, bowling, listening to music, and dancing. The favorite pastime, however, was drinking lager beer and wine and listening to music, sort of like today. It lasted until 1888 when homes were built on the Four Acre site. Magnolia Gardens was an outdoor beer garden and dance pavilion that opened around 1913 at the northwest corner of 3rd and Avery. It became Rainbow Gardens in 1924, being advertised as Louisville's Dance Palace with Dick Quinlan's Golden Derby Orchestra. It closed in 1930. Zender's Summer Garden, where Bardstown Road and Baxter come to get together, was the Zender's Summer Garden and Cherokee Park Tavern around 1890. Beer and food were a huge part of the equation here. The Tyler Park Pavilion, although not a beer garden as such, the Tyler Park Pavilion was built in 1924 against the wall of the Baxter Avenue overpass. This bandstand and outdoor theater was a centerpiece for live performance with stage lighting and dressing rooms. It was built, touted as a permanent structure, but within a few summers it was suddenly removed with little or no fanfare or explanation. Gypsy Village, it was built as part of the popular Fountain Ferry Park. This was another open garden or nightclub where people could dance, quote, under the stars. Probably built in the 1920s, it remained a part of the park until the park closed in 1969. Jake Schilling's band there on the upper right was very popular at Fountain Ferry with noted saxophonists. I talk a lot about saxophonists. Eddie Spees. This presentation certainly would not be complete without mention of John and J James Whalen, two brothers whose New Orleans family had come to Louisville by way of Cincinnati to set up shop in the quartet of gambling, whiskey running, burlesque, and of course, prostitution. They, they cleverly wrestled control of city government and the Democratic Party for nearly 40 years, beginning around 1880. While not so popular with government types, they were somewhat admired by trade unions and the disenfranchised. Being Irish Catholics, they were popular with the church. They built the famous Buckingham Burlesque Theater in the upper right there at 223 East Jefferson Street early on, which ultimately served as the centerpiece for all of their activities. The famous green room in the theater became the epicenter of city government, patronage activities, and control over local elections. Wayland's first encounter with the local constabulary was when they closed them down for showing a production entitled Female Bathers in the Sea which actually used a huge water-filled tub as the, quote, ocean. They knew from that point on that they had to get busy. It became an opportune time in Louisville for their various schemes. Oh, I might mention, in the lower two the images there, the brothers are still together in St. Louis Cemetery. Ragtime music and the brothels. The many brothels in the city were around both Green Street, which later became Liberty, between 6th and 10th. 
and in an area around Floyd and Jefferson Streets referred to as the Chute. The board representing the federal government about locating Camp Zachary Taylor here sent a Mr. Fostick, director of training and camp activities to question the mayor about cleaning up the moral decay of the city. He told Mayor John Bushmeyer, whose election was a product of the wrangling of the previously mentioned Whalen brothers, that you must close your disorderly houses and keep them closed. To which Bushmeyer said snappily, Louisville will do nothing of the sort. Those poor ladies would have no proper place to go and I will not be a party to any such outrage. So for, so for at least a time, the music at Shelley's Saloon and Milton Wiggins played on. Hawaiian Gardens was built in 1917 on the site of the former dance hall known as Arcadia on the northwest corner of 4th and Broadway in an arrangement with J. Graham Brown who owned the land and the, war Re and the Roar Recreation Board principally for soldiers at Camp Taylor to dance and be entertained by bands and orchestras. This was a beautiful building. There's a picture of the inside of it. In 1923, fire destroyed the facility and it was soon replaced by J. Graham Brown by the Martin Brown Building and later the Commonwealth Building, which is now gone as well. Okay, that's good. Let's go. Last call. Is that dramatic enough, Steve? <laughs> it's a sad day. <laughs> Taverns and beer depots were preparing to close up shop June 1919. This is downtown at Floyd and Market. Cunningham's prohibition went into effect in January 1920. So much of the music of bands and orchestras and popular dancing suffered miserably for what would be the next 13 years. The social lubrication of alcohol was a huge part of orchestras and dancing. The city of Louisville lost six to 8,000 jobs tied to alcohol. Many businesses in Louisville went into somewhat of an underground mode. Louisville, with its large ethnic population, especially Irish and German, would somehow find a way to obtain liquor and entertainment during this period, in spite of the federal government mandates. There were several Louisville establishments that in a clandestine way survived the long 13 years. One notable case being Cunningham's Restaurant at 5th and Breckenridge, which was owned by a police captain who ensured that the liquor cabinet stayed well supplied for his customers. Cunningham's has managed to survive to this day, of course, no longer famous for its liquor and its third floor nightly activities. I have two images of it here, one during its heyday during the 1930s and the other just a few weeks after it burned in 2001. Also famous for liquor being made available was Abe's White Doorknob, long gone, on Preston Street between Walt, Walnut and Liberty, and in the South End, Snyder's Iroquois Gardens, and then the Bite of Wee, short-lived but famous club. Even the Pendennis Club was cited for violations. The Bite of Wee only lasted for about three years in the Prohibition. But there's an interesting thing here at they, all the furnishings were sold at auction. Seems like the Wurlitzer Piano Company showed up at the auction because they had a so-called electric piano in there that was going to be auctioned, which they had a $600 lien on against the club. And you know what? They paid $600 in the auction and got their piano back. So. Melwood 
Hollywood Tavern, originally called the Rendezvous Inn, is set to be the oldest continuously operating tavern in the city of Louisville. It's been in the same location at 1801 Brownsboro Road since 1885. Since its start, it has been a tavern with live music. During Prohibition, it became a speakeasy. Many establishments such as this one were willing to defy the federal government, and they were able to survive with relative impunity, largely because there was sympathy at all levels within the city to allow it. End of Prohibition. Realizing that alcohol use was becoming uncontrollable, the federal government already had acquired a laissez-faire attitude toward allowing homebrew beer and wine. Knowing that prohibition was ending, starting in 1929, the federal government allowed special license to Glenmore and other distilleries to begin, begin production of spirits. After the formal declaration on April 6, 1933, known as Foamy Friday, efforts were made in Louisville to issue licenses to taverns, bars, and nightclubs. By 1939, when Louisville's Sunday Blue Law was repealed, bars, taverns, and beer joints quickly increased, numbering at least 1,000 by 1941. The city was making special concessions to allow businesses to make up for lost time. It just burst forth. After Prohibition, there was a proliferation of taverns, nightclubs, and bars that would last for the next 75 years through the Second World War, the post-war prosperity, and into the 2000s, before the decline of nightclubs that we see today. The viability of nightclubs is reflected in the membership of the two musicians' unions, both separately and following their merger in 1967. The peak membership of the unions was in that great period of live music, post-World War II until the 1980s, at around 1,500 members. The Sealback was opened by Brothers Otto and Louis Sealback in 1905 after closing their first hotel the Old Inn at 6th and Main. This pre-prohibition hotel had most of the great amenities of the day. There were three main venues for live music. Shown at the top was the roof garden during a dance. I don't see any cell phones, so I would place the time as latter 1940s. <laughs> Eventually, the area was remodeled into the 10th floor ballroom, as you see it today in the lower left there. On the first floor was the lobby bar called the Old Sealback Bar, a beautiful room that over the years has featured live jazz. The Dick Sisto Band was there for more than 20 years, and many Louisville Jazz Society events were played there. The bottom photo shows the basement event room known as the Rathskeller. Until the latter 1940s, it was referred to as the Dugout. A beautiful example of Rookwood pottery found 130 years ago in Cincinnati. The photo at the right it was the Carl Ellis Orchestra playing there for New Year's Eve, 1941, just after Pearl Harbor. The Brown Hotel, built starting in 1921 by lumber baron J. Graham Brown and opened in 1923 during Prohibition. A mecca of live music at the time in spite of Prohibition. Mention was made that when you attended a hotel event at the Brown, you had to quote, unquote, bring your own. I'm sure you get the idea. Built with two performing rooms, the Crystal Ballroom, and the third floor, on the third floor, and the 16th floor Art Deco roof garden, which was both enclosed and partially open to functions on the roof. That's it in the upper left there. Beautiful Art Deco architecture. The whole thing was carelessly removed and replaced with 
clean drywall in the 1970s. Though mo through most of its existence, the Brown had music in the lobby as well. Steve, it would really be a costly endeavor to go back to the Art Deco that they already had and tore out. And now that it's popular again, Steve Weiser, I'm saying this to him, not because he's president of the Louisville Historical League, because, but because he's a noted architect in the city of Louisville. So he has a lot of thoughts on architecture. In 1935, just post Prohibition, the hotel opened the bluegrass room. Is John Roy here? Yeah, here. Okay. Uh, adjacent to the second floor lobby, which for many years featured the big acts of the day Bing Crosby, Liberace, Buddy Rogers, Bob Hope, Dick Van Dyke, and others performed there. Even President Harry Truman had lunch in this room. The house band in the bluegrass room that backed up these acts for many years was led by Bob Jones and their excellent drummer, right? I don't have my glasses on to see that, but I believe it's right there, was a gentleman named John Roy, who is with us today. John, would you like to, yeah. I'm over there, but I'm so old I can't get up. Yeah, yeah in that picture, I'm a third from the left. And uh, I played there from, yeah, the, uh, the band was uh, already there at the Brown Hotel for some time. I got called to play there in 1949, and the season was nine months. So they closed every summer because I guess people in Louisville wanted to go vacationing or whatever. But they did have a lot of uh, an acts there and uh, it, was, it was very, very neat. People came there to have fine dining music, two floor shows a night, and eventually they had a matinee on Saturday. And the acts loved it because these were professional entertainers. Uh, the supper clubs were all across the country and they could go from one club to another and have very little downtime. And when you're in the business of traveling entertainer, you don't want to have much time off because there goes your money. So, and most of the supper clubs were in hotels. Therefore, they not only got their pay, they got free rooms. So it was a big deal. But it was a very, very famous time. Uh, and uh, I, I skipped a year and I worked with the Little Orchestra in 1950 when they played in Carnegie Hall in New York. And then I was in the Army Sharp Stand and I came back and went back to the Bluegrass Room and I worked the season there until the end of 1960. So we need to get a plaque for them to put on the wall because the Bluegrass Room, in a sense, yeah. is still there. Yeah, it was very good time. Yeah, good John, time. that's great. Just hold on to that mic because I think we're going to need it again. Let's see. Uh, this is Kentucky Hotel, which was also had the uh, Blue Room Lounge on the fourth floor. That's the Jimmy Robertson band, and they had constant entertainment, just like the other hotels. Not quite on the same scale. The Henry Clay, which was built as the Elks Lodge, uh, 3rd and uh, Chestnut. By the way, this band here, which performed in Crystal Terrace Room of the Henry Clay, was the uh, Helen Amet played accordion. But there are several really notable musicians in her band. One is about a 17 or 18 year old Jimmy Rainey, who became one of the great jazz guitarists of all time. He, he looks like the guitar is larger than him. <laughs> and also next to him was playing keyboards, strangely enough, because he was also a very famous uh, banjo hand jazz guitar player named Hayden Causey. He made great fame when he played with the Spike Jones band later in the 50s and 60s, and bass player named Eddie Castor. 
These are some of the other uh, venues we had for music, the Henry Watterson Hotel. Uh, Sticks McDonald was in there with his Dixieland Jazz Band. And uh, Eddie, I think this is where you come in here with the hotels, motels, Benbow, Admiral Benbow in. You want to talk about oh, yes. Uh, I actually led the first band that was the Admiral Benbow. They decided yeah. to have inter is this one? Yeah. They decided to have entertainment and uh, Dean Snyder of the Joni Agency uh, booked us in there and that was the first group I ever led and within the first three months I got fired out of my own group. That was <laughs> Then, you should so, have taken it to the union. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because uh, after I left, they uh, they got fired about a month after that because they didn't take care of business. They didn't dress right. They didn't rehearse. They didn't do the things that a good band should do to hang on to their job. Normal musicians. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Musicians. Yes. So. Uh, that was the Admiral Benbow. And then, how about Stouffer's? Uh... Stouffer's, I played Stouffer's in about 1974 with Susie Ogden. And, uh, Buzz Shelton, I think, was the uh, keyboard player. And they couldn't pay us enough money, uh, the amount of money that they thought we were worth. So once a week, we could go upstairs on the top floor and eat like a prime rib dinner or something like that. And Freddie George was playing upstairs on the top floor, which is somewhat ironic because uh, Jerry Green is going into that building now and Freddie George is gonna continue to play the cocktail hours for Jerry Green. Jerry Green is the gift that keeps on giving, you know what? Yes, he is. He, he just goes from place to place. Uh, the Churchill Inn here, uh, Welton Lane Welton was well Lane. known. He was there many, many years. And of course, all the Ramadas and the Holiday Inns were a great uh, source of work for live music. I mean, from piano bars to six, seven, eight, nine piece bands. Yes. Uh, Mayflower Hotel, 4th and Ormsby has had, over the years, not so much now, continuous music. Uh, Fran Gaddison, a wonderful keyboardist, Hammond organ, was there for many years. Now this is the Executive Inn, featured Kurt Siegert and his not-so-strolling strings. Uh, uh, strings in stereo. And Jeff Sherman, who provided me this photo, is on the lower right there, guitarist, is gonna make. I wouldn't come over there, but I'm too old. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, Kurt Singer actually came to this country in 1948 from Berlin, Germany and uh, settled in Virginia Beach and he met his wife Barbara there and they were playing uh, string quartets and orchestras there. And then uh, at one point Kurt went with Mondovani for a couple of years and then they started touring. So Kurt and Barbara came to the executive inn. I bet everybody here has seen Kurt's name out in front of that building. So uh, however they were just uh, contracted to play there for about six months in the meantime, Al Steeter, who had heard them, came in and bought it. So he brought them back from Dallas, and they were there for 30 years, essentially. Mm -hmm. I worked there from about 1980 to 88, and uh, when I left, they said, hey, the new kid's quitting. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, interesting, because that was actually on state property, and uh, Al Steeter, as long as he kept it under construction, didn't have to pay any of the principal of the loan off. Oh, so yeah. that's why it was kind of a labyrinth. It kept going different directions. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> to, to tell them about that benefit package you received. Uh, I actually have to say, I'm 63 years of playing music. This is the only uh, paid vacation I ever had. We had two weeks off with pay. So. Pretty, pretty incredible for yeah, the city, city, city of Louisville. And uh, this, Strolling strings, that was a great moniker for them to use 
all those years, except I know Kurt was adamant that we're not going to stroll. We'll stroll up. We will stroll up to where we're going to play. It, it made it mad when people called it. <laughs> but it, actually, it had birthdays and anniversaries, and people would come back from all around the country uh, for a weekend package. They'd have Kurt Seeger play the anniversary waltz for them, or anniversary song, actually. And what have you, industries. If they were working different shifts, they would, nightclubs would stay open and all hours of the day and night. Barron's Cocktail Lounge was nestled in between the Ohio and Kentucky theaters for many, many years, starting in the late 1940s. And uh, it was, uh, later became the Jewel Oak Lounge and some people would say the mint jewel of lounge. But they had started out at 11 in the morning or thereabouts and went into the late night hours. Here's some of the acts through the years that were at the jewel of lounge. Doris Johnson, great singer from Louisville and uh, little known, uh, which I'm gonna mention here shortly, Gloria Donaldson, who was involved with the number of nightclubs in the city along with her husband Eddie. Gloria was uh, Doris Johnson's sister. Riney South Sea Lounge. Uh, Eddie, any thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, my first club gig was there in about 1971. We followed Rick Hibble and Lou Stansfield in. Lou Stansfield used to sing Misty just like Donald Duck. <laughs> so that's, that's what he did. They were an excellent duo, and Ryanese had go-go dancers. At the hotel, please. And the, uh, um, yes, uh, the go-go dancers kept their tops on, by the way. It was considered a nice place, and uh, I think there was a national magazine that actually, photo player or something, called them the nightclub of the year in the early 60s. They had a manager whose name was Whitey, and Whitey hated uh, uh, daylight savings time because it, it it added all that an hour's worth of light, and his business didn't get going good until the sun went down. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that was Ryan's job. Someone asked about the location of it. It was in the first floor of the Kentucky Hotel, facing what was Walnut Street at the time. Yes. And by the way, this beautiful piano music here, do you know what it means to Miss New Orleans? Is Ellis Marcellus, the father of Wynton Marcellus. He was an incredible pianist. So anyhow, that's uh, uh, in legendary local musician, Jack Bringle, also played at the South Sea Lounge, I think it was at the time. The Ember's Restaurant on 4th Street with Jonah Jones Quartet and Camila, Camila Wilde, who was a local group. But Jonah Jones was from Louisville, but he had, of course, moved to New York. The Fig Tree Lounge. Uh, this was located uh, at 3rd and Broadway. It's known at various different times as Othello's and on Broadway. This is 1979, the Maximus Big Band. That was a great group that I had the privilege of playing in. Right there, I still had, had my hair was black at the time. <laughs> Pete Gerhardt and a lot of the really great local musicians played in this. And Ray Johnson, who's still playing here in Louisville, uh, is in there. A number of really fine players. Uh, Mika's Lounge. That was uh, south of Broadway on uh, Fifth Street uh, at York Street, very popular place. Willie D played there for a time. Do you, can you think of anyone else Eddie, that was at Mika's? I played there. Jeff Sherman played there. All right. All right. Yeah. It was gone in short order, but <laughs> this building's not even there today. There's Eddie and Gloria Donaldson. Uh, they had the legendary jazz club at the, called The Shack at 118 West Washington, and then later at the other end of the street was uh, at first, uh, second, second Street, 100, 100. at 200 was uh, 
what was called 100 West Washington Street, which was not a jazz club, but a nightclub. And then Gloria Donaldson had the downstairs at Actors called The Starving Artist, 1971, and she later owned the pub, which became the Jam Factory at Fifth and Broadway. Uh, famed jazz guitarist Pat Martino did a live recording at the 118 West Washington Street. The Wooden Nickel was a uh, pretty legendary place. Uh, Quentin Sharpenstein and Jim Ferris. Uh, Paula, <laughs> Quentin's wife is here. Do you have any thoughts on that? It lasted one year, 1967, 600 block of South 4th Street. But the band, yeah. the band lasted the band lasted 50 years. It's where you had the peanuts and you left the shells on the floor. The Jazz Factory was uh, Ken Shapiro and Diane April opened it in 2003 at uh, 815 West Market Street. And uh, it lasted longer than most jazz clubs. It went from 2003 till 2008. And that was the Bill Barnes jazz trio there with Ken Shapiro making the announcement about them playing. Zena's Blues Bar. A lot of folks here should know Zena. Uh, it's Keith Clemens. I'm here. You want to make any comments about Zena's? Well, what you're looking at is Mary Jane Zena. She was the heart and soul of that place. Uh, there was an original location on Market Street, and then they moved around the corner to West Main. And probably almost every blues player played here. It was a neat place. You played right up front against the windows. And uh, it just this was before places like Stevie Ray's was open. This was the one of the big blues places to go to downtown. How did it happen that they were open from 1929 till 2008? I mean, surely she wasn't. No, well, they might have passed down from generation to generation. And her husband. And it's very, yeah. Oh, I can say the same one thing. They were in the 70s, the same location was the windmill. Oh, it's the windmill, yeah. I remember the windmill. Yeah, that's, right. that, that's a good, appreciate you saying that. And on the wall up there were a lot of the. Uh, People at actors, they would come by here after they worked here and they would hang out here. Yeah. It was a legendary place. I remember when Cush Griffith played there, and I mean there are just a litany number of people that were that were involved with Zenas. And she was a very gratuitous, kind, kind person, well known to the blues community. When uh, when did she pass away, uh, Keith? Oh, it's been several years ago. You know, I couldn't put a date. But yeah. She was always there at the counter to, to serve you and to give you some good advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can all use some of that. Every sort of <laughs> Okay, and of course, even today, this was opened in the 1990s, Blues Club, Stevie Ray's. And it's a very well-managed uh, venue, and they play, what, is it six, seven nights a week? And, they uh, do, it's not, yeah, and it's not all blues. Sometimes no. you have to bring a little music in to make a little money. But, yeah. uh, there's well, a that wouldn't be jazz then. <laughs> <laughs> they tried it. Bluegrass. Yeah. They tried it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there are a couple of jam nights um, where, you know, aspiring musicians can come and sit in and play. Yeah. They had four jam nights. Yeah. yeah. That's a big part they of it. I have to say something about that. I have 33 portraits in C. Right oh my gosh, well that's great to know. Okay, uh, South Louisville. There are so many, many bars and nightclubs over the years. I and mean, it's just, not so much today, but the Silver Slipper, there's uh, John Roy. You, In fact, there's an 18 year old John Roy right there. <laughs> With a band called the Amplifiers. And the Silver Slipper uh, was operated by Michael John Linick III. Anyone know who that might be? Well, the re restaurant like Linick's today is here. Yeah, he and his brother. 
he and his brother uh, came out of the army and uh, opened that club. The club was already there, it was over Shively area, Dixie Highway. Uh, and uh, they, uh, Norm Carlisle was the band leader, he's the guy on the right. He went to, uh, wanted to put a band in there three nights a week. And uh, the, the, the Lennon guy said, we, we don't, we're about ready to close. We can't get enough people in here. And so Norm said, well, I'll make a deal. We'll play two weeks. If you don't make the money, you don't owe us anything. So he did. The second week, we were packed. Wow. It was really a good group and unusual for that size group. Uh, uh, <coughs> pardon me. Norm Carlisle was the band leader. He also wrote arrangements. Billy Taylor was the pianist, and he also wrote arrangements. So those two guys wrote arrangements for everything. The only uh, time you weren't actually reading what was on the paper was if you were so old. Yeah. Improvisation. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a nice group. That's uh, 1946 I have here. Maybe that's guess when he opened. Uh, but yeah, it's great. Yeah. Uh, the Flamingo Dance Club. Uh, <laughs> it's famous for the fact that <laughs> it was short-lived. I think it, it was in existence for about five years. And I found this in the old Courier thing talking, mentioning the Flamingo Nightclub along with some of these others as using union musicians. I thought, my goodness. Yeah, I thought that was a nice, uh, a nice thing. It says the following nightclubs uh, used union labor. But this group here, uh, who had, uh, they all met in a, in a juvenile detention center and they got together and decided to hold up the Flamingo Club one night. And they got a hold of some Thompson submachine guns and they went in there and they had all the, the women take all their jewelry off and set it on the tables. They went to the cash registers and cleaned them out. And uh, it was a fairly sordid event for the time. And uh, within about a week, every one of them were captured. But it was a pretty bold move on their part. 7th Street and Ferry Boulevard, there's just so many, I've kind of grouped these clubs. The Log Cabin Club, which morphed into a club called Bachelors 2, the Log Cabin Inn, Lemon Tree Lounge, and the Say When Club at various different times. The Domino Lounge, these were all in that corridor, 7th Street and Ferry Boulevard. Bill's Cocktail Lounge, uh, and the uh, Tree and I nightclub with their uh, uh, Hugh uh, Wade's band, the, the Wade band was in the, uh, the Pat Patton's band. Yeah, uh, uh, Pat Patton, yeah, he, uh, he's not in this picture, but I know he was there. The New Mill Club, which later became the Ansbury's Nightclub, uh, Dancing Night, but this is all for, uh, late 1940s through old, at the latest, the end of 1950s. Now we have the, what I call the Bermuda Triangle of show bars, which was 7th and Berry Boulevard. The Arch Club, which was, this is a current overview that I took off of Google Maps. That's the only one of the three that's just still extant. It's called the Thoroughbred Lounge today. The Five O'Clock Club, which was a show club, was sat there, which is now BP Station. The White Castle, which I don't know if it was there at the time, but that had nothing to do with music. But, and then the merry-go-round, and we have a star from the merry-go-round with us today, Mr. Danny O'Brien. All right, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, I have, uh, I solved a problem uh, very early in my musical career as uh, Gary was saying, uh, uh, jobs were, I mean, you only kept a, a gig for a couple of weeks if you were lucky, 
and uh, maybe a little longer, but you were always, uh, money was kind of hard to, to keep, I mean, to, as a profession, as a musician. So I started out in uh, Go-Go Girls, with Go-Go Girls in the 19, about 1966, when a place called the 1555 Club. And we had Go-Go Girls. And I wanted to, to go to school, and I started uh, at JCC, and I, I wanted to figure out a way I could keep you know, a regular regular gig. So I, I started working for Dick Asher at, uh, at the Arch Club, and when I was there, it was a clubhouse. And uh, we had a whole line of strippers that he used to bring, and he owned the merry-go-round, which was across the street, and what we do, what we would do, we would have a game that would start like at 10 o'clock at night, and would play from 10 till about two in the morning. And at that time, he would bring all these girls from across the street over, and we put a floor show on. And that was like at three or four o'clock. We're talking this is early 70, 71, 70, 71, and that was when it was illegal. So I uh, had some problems with that. But uh, so I was actually working there when uh, he employed a, a band with uh, trumpeter Earl Lee, which was a, across the street at the merry-go-round called the Three Guys Trio. And Benny Holton was on piano. And, uh, and uh, around that time, he, he, uh, he and a lot of other people realized that he didn't have to have a live band. All he needed was a girls and records, you know. And so I was at, uh, I was there at the, uh, uh, at the Arch Club or the clubhouse the night uh, that they, they completely got rid of the entire band across the street, which had been playing now like 17 or 18 years early in them. And so, uh, uh, I got the idea, I wanted to, uh, to keep working, actually, and Frank Link, Frank Linkenberger, I think was his name, was a really fine uh, uh, stand-up comic, singer, entertainer. He was in town, and he went to, uh, went to Vegas. In fact, he died out there uh, back, in the, back during that time. Gotcha. But I, I, uh, I got his... I told Dick Asher, I said, you know, I can do that stand-up, and the guy, and I'll never forget uh, him saying to me, you think you've got the, you, know, you can do that? And I said, yeah, I can, you know. So I started doing stand-up, and then they got rid of the bands. So there weren't any bands, and so I got the idea to start using music minus one tapes, sound and sounds, of, you know, behind me to sing. And so I would sing and tell my jokes and everything. I did that for almost 10 years. And I worked my way through U of L through two degrees doing it. So you were there, what, about 15 years all told? Oh, no, 10 years. 10, yeah, about 10 yeah. years. And uh, okay. Billy Reed, when I got my BA uh, in the early 70s, uh, he did an article on me in the newspaper in the Courier called Scholar Among the Strippers. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. and uh, okay, well, we're going to move on here. Sure. Uh, Sure. Uh, and John Roy, of course, this was another short-lived club, the Five O'Clock Club, where, John, I tell you, you've worked with about everybody. If, the, <laughs> if you live long enough, you get <laughs> uh, I did. In fact, I saw where you were on that uh, uh, paddle wheeler at the, the second slide. I think I saw you in there. Was I there too? Yeah. <laughs> I was into so many places, that's why I was late getting here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Gary, I'll make this short about the five o'clock club. I, I know you're going to move on. Uh, it was opened by a guy that came here from New Jersey. And it was a small club. And his name was Jack Angelo. And he had a guy working there named Doc and a guy named Paz that he brought with him. Uh, so I got a call from the union. I played a lot of shows in my life, and so I got a call up that he was going to put in the show. So I went out there and met him. And he never said you. He always said use. And that should tell you something right there. And so 
I had checked with the union and the local scale back then, this is 1951 or two, was $177, no, I mean, sorry, $77 a week to play a show. And so he says, Johnny, how much do you want to play here? And I said, well, I don't know, I'll check at the union. I had already checked, of course. And he said, well, you just think a hundred and a quarter will be enough. And I said, I believe that'll be satisfactory. <laughs> and he took me in the office. He opened up a desk drawer. He had stacks of money in there. He had a gun. He also had a gun in a holster hanging on the back of a chair. And he's a little guy. And he was so pleasant and so nice. So anyway, I get there, I rehearsed the show with a trio he brought in from Chicago. Uh, and they happened to be some really fabulous players. Uh, Herb Ellis was the guitarist in that group. And uh, they, they were great. Anyway, so I played the show uh, the first night. And the second night, I come in and the guy said, hey, they didn't use drums. He said, sit in and play with us. So I played the whole thing with that group for a couple of months. But then I found out uh, several years later, I read in the paper, a guy in pres prison named Jack Angelo, alias so-and-so, alias, alias again, alias, alias, seven aliases, died in prison. And uh, so that was part of the New Jersey Mafia. Yeah, yeah that's kind of interesting. Same place. guy that hired you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guy yeah. that hired me. Wow. Okay. We're Club Fabulon. I don't know a lot about the Club Fabulon, but they had as, you know, bands of this size uh, up through the mid to late 50s. Uh, they were seventh in that whole corridor. I could tell you that was a mecca, wasn't it? I mean, for it was. Yeah, it was really something else. Okay, Colonial Gardens, uh, otherwise known early as Sennings Park, uh, and. In fact, Steve Weiser, I think you're in this photograph, photo someplace at the renewal, and it's been going on since the very first part of the last century. There's some very early photos, 1920s, of the garden area, the petting zoo, the restaurant, and the outdoor pavilion. Iroquois Gardens was very famous for bringing in some of the big acts and the big bands. Here's. Uh, well, the Cincinnati Six was one of the openers, November 1924. Uh, Ray Barr, which was a local band, very popular, and that's in their dance pavilion outside. And then uh, Tex Beneke, which had the Glenn Miller Band, Woody Herman's Band, and Don Reed. I'm not familiar with Don Reed, but his trombone and orchestra is very famous. Uh, 7th Street Road, uh, Schneider's Roadhouse, Artie Jones Orchestra, and this is Artie Jones playing trombone. He was the president of the local 637, which was the black local when we had the segregated locals before merger, which was 1967. And uh, so this was his band playing at the Schneider's Roadhouse near Iroquois Park. And then the Downs Paddock Lounge in the South End, right by Churchill Downs. This is one of the finest dance bands that's ever been in the city of Louisville, folks, right here. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was owned by a gentleman named Earl Gar, whose son, Earl Edwin Gar, is a surgeon. He's head of uh, surgery at the VA hospital. Of course, this, this has been all raised and demolished, this property. But he saved the front sign and had it restored, and he's got it in his basement bar. That's where it is today. Dandy Jim's Club, uh, which is at Preston Oak, and Oak, also known as the 537. And Willie Bright, who was, I think, an alderman, opened it as the 537 Club. And then later, the DNO Club, Preston and Oak. Dandy Jim's, and also uh, Jim Dandy's. It was a restaurant. I think it was Jim Dandy's and the nightclub, Dandy Jim's. The Zanzibar, I think everyone knows the Zanzibar. It's been going since 1938. It's got a beautiful performing area in it. And uh, still there. it's still there, that's right. In fact, I was there about three or four weeks ago. 
with uh, Mr. George Weatherby, one of my friend who's sitting over here on the left, my left. Charlie, this, during the heyday of Walnut Street, which was between 5th and uh, roughly 14th of railroad crossover there, Charlie Moore's club was at 914 West Walnut. It was an old converted movie theater. And he had not a regular, uh, didn't have regular live music, but when he did have live music, they played in the balcony up there. That's where he had the bands. And they're very popular at the time with the, these bars made out of glass brick. You see that a lot, and you'll see it here in the next image or two. With Top Hat Jazz Club, which was the quintessential jazz club in the city of Louisville. It's where Cannonball Adderley, so many of the soldiers who, who were later, later became famous jazz artists that were based at Fort Knox would come and play at the Top Hat. And there's their glass bar. There's an interior shot in the front of it. Club Neon, 18th and Maple, they had floor shows there for many, many years. Jam sessions on the weekends. Joe's Palm Room, which is legendary. The building sat uh, dormant all through the later 1980s until about three or four years ago and a group of investors got together and they have completely redone the inside uh, it's, this is Joe Hammond, and Joe Hammond contributed so much to the city of Louisville. He was a very legendary person. And this is the way the club looks uh, today. It's beautiful. I was in, in there about three nights ago, and it was just an incredible place. It's 1800 block of uh, West Jefferson Street. And there's early shots there with Boogie Morton and Joe Cook, singer and Boogie's group in the 1960s. The Club Louisvillian, someone asked me about that recently. The Club Louisvillian had two different locations that overlap one another. 1137 South 2nd Street at Oak, and then later uh, at the, in a, what had been a car dealership, 22nd and Broadway. And they really had uh, a lot of the rock bands in the day. Uh, anybody here that was there at all during the period. I know I was in there once or twice. Mr. D's Inferno, uh, 1960s through the 70s on uh, Grand Avenue. Sills Lounge, it's still going. Uh, Sylvia Arnett started it 25 years ago. And uh, it's at 2403 West Broadway. They have live, steady, live music. I don't think there's anything in there uh, today. Oh my gosh, folks. I'm gonna have to really rush through this because I've, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the Inn Lagola, which was what was known as a roadhouse. You may recognize it as a home of Highland, uh, of the American Legion post. It was at that same, in that same building, the log cabin part of it. In Lagola had a big area in the back, a shed that they'd open up during the summer and bring in big bands and things. This was early here uh, in Lagola with Milburn Stone Orchestra, local orchestra. Office Lounge with Willie D. I think we know about that Mid City Mall. Tom Sobel knows about the Mid City Mall. He's with us today. Uh, come on. <laughs> uh, Brady's Cocktail Lounge, which was later became the House of Shepherd in St. Matthews. Great venue for live music. Hassan Hours Restaurant from 1952 to 1996 when it went out of business. And uh, there's the Elmo Tucker Jug Band that was there during uh, Dirty's Mansion. It's a constant source of live music and uh, a lot of groups that uh, Tim Kreckel was in there for many years and local bands. Gerstles, no coils. I had to look that up because this didn't come from Gerstles, but I pulled this off the internet. It meant that the uh, beer came directly. Uh, it, it did not go through any coils before it was served 
to you, so it was always going to be nice and cold. Garland Flaherty, who is the, the amazing family of six brothers, who had quite an impact on the restaurant scene and the nightclub scene in Louisville. Flaherty's Three, which was on DuPont Circle uh, through the 70s, maybe the 80s too. But they had had the Essex House, Barstown Road and Watterson Expressway, and also the Rose Bowl lanes, they had the venue in there, restaurant and bar. Any thoughts on that, Eddie? Uh, played there in 74. Garland had a certain formula. Uh, he would bring in a band with a male front person. The idea was if he could draw in the ladies, the men would follow because they're going to go anywhere the ladies are. And he had a female at the small bar, and she would play the breaks for the band, and then at midnight they would have a show where the female would join the band and they do about an hour show. And Garland worked very hard, he was a very nice man. I remember the uh, place was too busy for the band to rehearse during the day. So the only time to rehearse was after hours. And I remember we did that one night, I had to be going to the men's room and there's Garland cleaning the urinals himself. <laughs> so yeah, he, yeah. he was a hands-on person that year. And, and uh, St. Patrick's Day was Wall to wall people. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then you can comment on this too, Eddie. This is Pussycat a go go. I'm not sure when it started, but it was originally a pretty nice place. Uh, Jeff will back me up. He was there that night in 1969 when we saw Buddy Rich's band there. And that may have been the place where a group called the Heavyweights began. They were an excellent show group. Yeah, they opened for Buddy. Yeah, they opened for Buddy, and Buddy made a point of complimenting both the band and the drummer, yep. oh. Gerald Thompson. And uh, yeah, I, and I saw him there about six months after that. It was a different band, and Buddy didn't compliment that band. <laughs> so, I, Would we know any of those people? That... <laughs> uh, a few. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to move through this. Tom Sobel. Uh, who owns the Comedy Caravan, and he has been very gracious over the years in allowing a lot of music groups that would not produce any revenue for him, but he's been so generous. Any thoughts on that, Tom? Well, that's not stomping on it. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> there's uh, the Don Crackle. Let's see, we got the Don Crackle big band and Roger Dane's big band at different times. Jennifer Lawletta singing. So, we and built, yeah, I tell you, I rebuilt the stage in the Washington stage in 1992 so that I could change the size of the <coughs> stage to accommodate big bands. And the first big band to perform on the stage was uh, Count Basie. Oh my gosh, oh, wow. Count Basie's band. Well, that's that started a legacy that's, that's still true today. The Vernon Club, that's just reopened and that's uh, an eight lane bowling alley and the, in the undercroft part of it, they have had live music over the years. This goes back to the 1890s and uh, I won't comment further on it, but they've really done a nice job in renewing it and rebuilding the, the restaurant and lane, the bowling lane part of it. Toy Tiger, which was uh, outgrowth of the Brown Suburban, the Brown Suburban uh, was a dinner theater for a long period of time, and it's very legendary. I don't think we need to dwell on that so much. <laughs> Babe Waldman's Patio Lounge. Uh, I took this picture of Bill Chase, that band Chase that was so popular in the 70s that was there. And, Captain's Quarters, Billy Lowe's band, uh, the Captain's Quarters. And that's uh, been a great place for entertainment over the years. Headliners Music Hall since 2010. There's something in there within the last few nights, Headliners. Phoenix Hill, long gone. 
Ben Rogers closed them both in 2015. Kind of sad. And uh, this this Jim Porter's had about four different rooms, and he would have as, as many as four bands playing simultaneously in there. Uh, the Clefus family, uh, which owned Clefus, which was near downtown, and then later the Spring Street Tavern, which had previously be owned, been owned by Pappy McMitchin, who was an excellent fiddler, and, I'm, and there it is when he owned it. It was called Pappy McMitchin's Club, and uh, he performed Texas Swing. He had horns and they had fiddles and what have you. It's closed right now, by the way. <laughs> The Duke drop in. Uh, a nice place for nice people with a dance floor that's what terrific like the Atlantic. You know, terrific some, like Pacific. Gigantic like you. the Atlantic and terrific like the Pacific. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet as the breeze off of Lake Erie. <laughs> <laughs> the Lake Erie. A guy named Bubba White for years had the band. He was a great steel guitar player. His son, Tommy White, is the steel player at the Grand Ole Opry today. And also Eli Hall, the two notable musicians that played there for a long, long time at the Dewdrop. Uh, the Sahara nightclubs. You know, this goes on and on, folks. I tell you, I'm, uh, I'm coming to the end, believe it or not. Uh, there's a lot more to be said about so many of these places. The Sahara. Uh, it was famous Ronnie Burden, who was a local celebrity, was there for many years. Karen Kraft, and also a band called the New Kermit, was at the Sahara. There were two Saharas, one at Evergreen Shelbyville Road, and the other one, 3606 Bartstown Road in Mutual. And uh, so, Indiana, the Club Greyhound, very, very famous. They had a dog racing track there. They had all kinds of gambling and what have you. It was always a very controversial place, but they had big bands uh, all through the years, the 30s and 40s, and I'm not exactly sure. I don't know if I have the closure date. Mostly 1930s, up until World War II, I would say. The Enchanted Forest, that's a current venue in New Albany. It's a great place, folks. They've got a microbrewery there. They've got several restaurants, and they literally have a forest outside. This is a night scene, and they have bands. Not, I don't know if it's regularly, but they have bands uh, all through the summer months outside, and it's a great, great place. And it's open now. <laughs> And I want to give a shout out for Warder Park in Jeffersonville, Indiana, because uh, Sonny Brewster and, and Barb Brewster, who run, who have run through the uh, Jeffersonville Main Street Association for the last 25 years, have been so helpful with live music, providing every Friday evening live music at the pavilion there in Water Park, which is Court Street and Spring in Jeffersonville. Here's some that I just, this could go on, I guess I should say ad nauseum. I mean, I'd like to say so much more. But. That's all. I can only give you country walks in springtime. There's the gallery at the Falk Audio Building across from General Electric, Fern Valley Pass. 6303 Fern Valley Pass. If anyone wants to see about 600 images of Louisville music from the late 1800s till today, they're on display and you're welcome to. Come and visit.
Don't forget to support.